production of Ruckus is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Hartwig family, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckettes join me shortly in our topics this week, an economics test from Yale, Abu Haka, testing the patience of restroom monitors and monitoring the future of 18th and Vine, plus roast and toast. But we start with our newsmaker segment and meet the creator of Beyond Belief, premiering right after tonight's Ruckus program. Steve Mincher runs his own media company and has been spending time in Kansas City and at KCPT the past year, putting the finishing touches on Beyond Belief. The program is described as exploring the interplay of religious life with youth, culture, race, civic engagement, and economic disparity. To explain those elements and how they fit together and to tell us more about tonight's program, we welcome Steve Mincher to Ruckus. Steve, thanks for coming in. Well, thanks so much for having me, Mike. It's really a privilege. There's a lot more involved with your project than one television program. Uh, you have a website, you have community meetings. Tell us more about the whole concept of Beyond Belief. Well, thanks for asking. Uh, when I first got here, I got here in uh, Halloween, on Halloween from Washington, D.C., where I live. And the project is a nine-month project. And the idea was that it's mainly engagement is what the, it's the new buzzword in public media. How do you get the community engaged in your work? Public media, public radio, public television doesn't have a terrific track record about engagement. Uh, they're all about raising money. They appeal. PBS, for example, uh, which we're part of PBS as KCPT, appeals to an audience that's over 50 years old, that has income over 50, 60, 70, 100 thousand dollars. So that wasn't what Lyndon Johnson had in mind when he started back in the 60s when he started public media. His idea was that this was going to be different than commercial media and it was going to allow communities to tell their own stories. So the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, which gives most of the money to my project through a group called the Association of Independence in Radio, which is just multimedia crazies like me, um, they thought it was time to shake up public media. And 15 of us are all around the country. Shaking. I was going to say similar projects are going <laughs> say, on elsewhere, shaking not, not as just as in can. Kansas yeah, City. Yeah. Uh, we're going to see the premiere of the show this evening right after Ruckus. Yeah. Is this the only show, or do you hope there will be more? This is nine months that uh, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting will consider us a failure if we don't make an impact. We had a party here uh, on Tuesday night where that African choir that we just heard came and sang for the audience, and several people booked them for, uh, for gigs where uh, the people from Rick Barron's uh, church in Kansas City, Kansas, came and felt like because some of the documentary is in Spanish, they felt welcome. What we're doing is making connections. Mindy Corcoran was here. I think yeah. I have my love button right. on, and I'm sorry, I touched my microphone. Mindy Corcoran was here, and she is looking for support for her seven days project so that she maybe could quit her day job and go full time doing this kind of anti violence. Now, work. we have three segments on tonight's program. Let me play a brief excerpt from one of them. I believe it's when there are students from Kansas City, Jewish students, African American students visiting the South, yep. looking at civil rights landmarks yep. and crossing the Selma Bridge. Thanks. I was really like spiritually connected to what happened. I mean, it, to me, like it was only what, like 51 years since that had happened. And so to be walking in the same, like, on the same bridge, like, the footsteps of people who made all the things that I, like, I just voted last week, so the fact that that was possible because the sacrifices and the courage of the people that walked that same bridge that I just walked. And Steve, besides that segment, you have two others, one about African refugees mm -hmm. taken care of by a church congregation mm -hmm. and another congregation that does services in, in a bilingual manner, right? In English, yes. And, and I know our time is short, but I wanted to go back to this story of walking over the Selma Bridge. Right. We have, uh, we're fortunate enough to have a little cameo by John Lewis. Mm -hmm. uh, and Civil rights icon in the U.S. Civil rights icon House. and the person who is changing America by yesterday sitting in on the House or of the Representatives floor. floor with Emanuel Cleaver, our congressman. I'm in awe of what they're doing and Part of what we're doing is trying to figure out, can a journalist uh, say that he's for something or against something? 
I can tell you that I'm for gun control for, and still feel like I'm a journalist. All right. Uh, we're down to just a few okay. seconds, yeah, yeah. so we want to tell people to watch the program oh, tonight. But, but what else can we tell people to do if they're interested in this project? They see the program, they say, this is great, I want to help, or I want more information, what then? Absolutely. Go to the website, uh, kcpt.org slash beyondbelief. Uh, if you see this and you see the documentary, take a picture of yourself, take a picture of your church, take a picture of your baby, and hashtag it, Finding America, and tell KCPT that you would like this work to continue, and join KCPT, see our development director, let's get some money in the house to make this work continue. Well, I, you couldn't have a better lead-in than Ruckus. <laughs> exactly. Steve, <laughs> Steve, thanks for stopping in. That is Steve Mincher, the creator of Beyond Belief, airing at 7.30 tonight, right after this program. Now, let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. Jamika Kendricks is an education activist. Annie Presley is a former political fundraiser, now an author and publisher. Steve Glorioso is a political and media consultant. And Patrick Tuohy is manager of the Show Me Institute in Kansas City, a libertarian think tank. I'm Mike Shannon, the only one wearing a necktie. <laughs> Ruckus <laughs> alumnus and Kansas City Star columnist Yale Abahaka has found an interesting approach to getting Kansas Cityans to think about how their tax dollars are or could be spent. He's picked 10 areas the City Council talked about recently at a vision, missions, and values meeting, whatever that may be. Yale gives readers the option to agree or disagree with the premise of each and ask them to send their answers to him for tabulation and publication. To find out what the readers say, you'll have to check the star this morning, Thursday morning. To find out what the Ruckettes say about a few of the questions, you can stay here. First question, <laughs> the elected officials and business community better get back to promoting the benefits of a new single $1 billion terminal at KCI. The functional dump we have now won't last. Agree, disagree, Steve Glorioso. Well, the little alert here. It's 57% of the people that responded we, said that they we should. We don't need to give the results, okay, Steve. Well, I, uh, I want <laughs> to say that I'm being supported by the public. Uh, I think the, that we do need to continue to at least to have the dialogue about a new airport. Uh, obviously, the, nothing lasts forever, and that airport is becoming uh, functionally obsolete. It's also could be a, a security risk of the worst kind. Uh, the driving a truck up to the curb you would be Timothy McVeigh, you'd be closer to the airplanes than he was to the uh, Murrell building in Oklahoma City. So there's, uh, it's got some serious cons uh, concerns. And if you think it couldn't happen here, ask the people in San Bernardino. So you agree they've got to get started again on yes. the project but to it's gonna uh, take a change while. the airport. The polling on it, which uh, was, was partially made public, was overwhelmingly, 39% was the most they could get to support a new airport. Um, so if they want to try it in a year or so, that yes, they need to talk to the public. All right, let's go over here. Jamika, agree or disagree with the premise of that I question? I think they need to try, stop selling us stuff that we don't want. So if the public is saying we don't want a new one, one terminal airport, then let's figure out how to give the public what they want because the people who are going to be utilizing it are us. And so if the highest you could get was 39% that said we want a single terminal, stop trying to sell it to us. Give us what we want and spend our money in a better way. Annie. Well, I love Yale's use of the word dump. <laughs> Referring to the airport, it's not exactly a dump, but I do think that um, we really need to see some hard numbers. There's this conversation from Southwest Airlines that they're going to pay for the bulk of it, and I think we just really need to get to the math on it, and that'll be very, very helpful for people to make decisions about what's true. And, and I would add, this is not exactly a scientific survey or <laughs> designed to be that. Patrick, agree or disagree with I the agree premise? I agree with everything Jamika said. I think the problem here is that the city has decided on a solution that doesn't have a problem. Uh, we do have hard numbers on airports, and, and, uh, and we know that too many other cities have invested billions in airports only to see flights decrease. Okay, we'll move on. Harsh critics of Kansas City's numerous incentive programs for private businesses are correct. City halls should dramatically slim down, uh, slim down the tax break packages being given out. Agree or disagree? Steve. I, I personally agree, yes. I think the, the process is broken. Uh, there are good uses of TIFs and incentives but they have become uh, sort of the flavor of the day and, and they're, they're, they're appearing in areas that 
shouldn't need incentives anymore for economic development. Got to move along quickly. Patrick? I completely agree, and I'm glad that Steve has come around to the Show Me, <laughs> Show Me Institute's point of thinking. Uh, Annie, what do you think? I agree as well. And Jamaica? I agree. All right. <laughs> Here's next one. Expanding the streetcar to near the University of Missouri, Kansas City campus for a cost of $230 million does not make sense. Come back in a year or so after the downtown line has operated longer. Agree or disagree, Steve? I, I, I think we ought to proceed the way they're doing it. It'll be a year before they even get it to a vote, and by then people can make a judgment. Patrick? Uh, you know, all the information we have on the streetcar, it doesn't suggest that we need to expand this thing. Uh, it's very expensive. Uh, ridership is high, but then ridership was high in Tucson and Atlanta before ridership tanked. And we've just recently learned that the property values in the transportation development district around the streetcar are actually lower today than they were in 2012. It's not a driver of economic Jamaica. development. I agree. With I agree that we should. While, right? I, well, I agree that we need to wait because I think the city does too much, and even with the tax incentive plans, where we are doing things without measuring whether or not it's effective, and that's just wasting money. So right. I think we should wait. Annie, I think it's a party bus. It's fun, <laughs> but it's really not a commuter tool. All right, one more, and we'll go fast through this. The Northland is the future of Kansas City. Let's use far more public funds to upgrade streets, parks, trails, fountains, and other amenities to attract people there. Steve? I uh, disagree. Disagree. I mean, it is the future in terms of our population expansion, but um, a few incentives make sense in some areas, but it really shouldn't be overdone. Patrick, what about the Northland? Well, I think Steve's exactly right. That is where the population growth in Kansas City has been for a number of years. But again, uh, we should be focusing on infrastructure in the whole city before we're worried about fountains up north. All right, Annie? We just need to make good decisions that are good for everybody. So not particularly favoring the north? Not so sure we need to favor anybody. Right, Jerica? And I agree with what everybody said. <laughs> Excellent. This we're is done. like the nicest ruckus ever. Everybody agrees. What a, what a great segment. Uh, all right. <laughs> the KCI uh, question, the stars answer, the people who responded 57 agree, 43 disagree about tax breaks for uh, people starting new businesses agree, 65, 35 disagree. Streetcar, it was a 50 50 tie, and about the future of the Northland, most people disagreed with the idea. <laughs> Unless you have been tucked away in a cave and impervious to mass media, you know there's a huge battle over school finance going on in Kansas. But overlooked and underreported is an action taken by the Kansas Board of Education to ignore an order from the Obama administration about transgendered students and their restroom choices. Non-compliance with the federal mandate could cost the state nearly $500 million in federal aid. In a 10-0 vote, the board left it to local school districts to decide which restrooms transgendered students can use. Federal officials ordered that all public schools must allow transgendered students to use the restroom matching their gender identity, not necessarily their physical characteristics. In short, a male student who identifies as a female is allowed to use the girl's restroom and vice versa. So what about the Kansas board? Is its decision courageous or dangerous? We start with Jamaica. I think it's a bit of both. Um, I think it's courageous to take that stance of we need to allow the local communities to address the issue because this is one that now is politicized and we want to have the federal government stepping in and we want politicians making those decisions. I think it's dangerous because of the funding attached, so I'd like to see what that is. But I personally think that um, when it comes to decisions like that, I think it is left best to the local communities because we best understand the needs in our schools and in our communities. And if we're saying that we don't want the federal government, you know, uh, mandating everything within our communities, then why are we allowing it to do it in schools? And I think the schools have already found good solutions to how to deal with this. But, but, but the government's already done this. The order has already been issued. The mandate has been issued to the states. So is it courageous or dangerous for the state board of education to say, pay no attention to what the Obama administration has mandated? Actually, it's a little bit dangerous sounding, but I think it is courageous that they are going to take it state by or district by district and make your own decisions. But I'd like to put a little perspective on this conversation, Mike, because we're talking about 700,000 people in the United States who identify trans. So that is one third of 1% of the population in the United States. 
the danger, I think, is that we're making this a bigger issue than it needs to be. And like Jamika said, many districts have solved the problem on their own without federal mandates. And um, to put the money in danger for each district, I think, is very, very aggressive and truly sets up another partisan conversation that is super not needed for one-third of one percent of the population. Patrick, by what stretch of the U.S. Constitution can one find the responsibility of the federal government to mandate what restrooms transgendered students use in all the public schools in America? Well, I think you've answered your own question. Uh, it, <laughs> I'd like to do that. <laughs> uh, it's not there. This is the interjection, unfortunately, of politics masquerading as policy. This is not a serious need in school districts. School districts around the country have been solving this. Uh, on their own, uh, piecemeal as needed, but this uh, invites lawsuits, uh, states versus the federal government, families within districts, and it's going to make a big mess, and, and children, perhaps, who need special attention are now going to become the subject of angry adults. Steve, have we found anything that you might think is federal overreach? Well, let me throw this out. <laughs> Suppose that um, the federal government said that school districts can't segregate bathrooms by race. Would anyone here say, oh, my God, thank God they're doing that? I mean, this is a, a political diversion from a Kansas legislature that appears to not give a damn about if the schools close in a month. So, you know, fund education in but, Kansas. But the Kansas oh. legislature didn't issue this mandate. No, the but Obama I, I, I administration mean, but they, issued it. But they've it. all jumped on it. Legislators are pretending they're going to introduce legislation. I mean, it, it's a diversion. This, it's this one is of those right-wing things. This is Look over here this rather is the than Kansas solve board. education. This, this is not the legislature. This is the Kansas Board of Education. I understand. But you've had legislators who say they're going to introduce legislation to oppose the federal mandate. And like I said, you want we, why don't we segregate by race? Why I don't, don't, go, I don't think that has said, any relationship. I want to go to what he said about race because I think that integration was one of the worst policies that we ever created. <laughs> I honestly do, mm -hmm. and I don't think it was bad. It was bad, bad intention. Just like I don't think the bathroom policies are bad intention. But what did it solve? It forced black families to go into white schools. And then the white family said, this is not what we want. They're angry. They move. And now we have it segregated where urban schools are primarily black or people of color and suburban schools are primarily white. And so it doesn't solve the problem. And if we hadn't made it this politicized issue in the first place, then we would be able to have strong communities of color that aren't gentrified all the time in order to address issues that politicians say are going to help them get elected. As we're taping this on a Thursday morning, you recruit her for the Show Me Institute. Uh, <laughs> As we're taping this on a Thursday morning, June the 23rd, legislature is going back into session in Kansas to try to resolve the school funding issue. What do you think the legislature will do, Patrick? Gosh, I have, I have no idea what they'll end up doing, and I suspect a lot of the legislators don't know themselves what the outcome will be. But the problem here is that we do not know in the United States what it costs to educate a child, and so all this stuff about uh, courts and what's standard and what's equitable is, is meaningless. Well, we'll see. Interesting topic for the future, what happens in the <laughs> Kansas legislature special session. There was an old song whose title might well describe the Kansas City City Council's ambivalence toward the 18th and Vine Jazz District. The song is undecided, and the lyrics go like this. First you say you do, and then you don't. And then you say you will, and then you won't. You're undecided now, so what are you gonna do? That was either Annie Presley or Ella Fitzgerald singing. <laughs> a few weeks ago, there was announcement of a plan to spend $27 million to fix 18th and Vine. Then the plan was sidetracked, and now it may be back. Is spending millions more the answer to the district's problems, which include a lack of business development and a lack of interest from the public? Patrick. No. And this debate has been had around the country in the mid-90s, for example, about the time that we were trying to develop uh, 18th and Vine down in Memphis, they were trying to develop Beale Street, and they had very two uh, very different approaches. John Elkington, who developed Beale Street down in Memphis, said, we do not want government money. This has to be private expenditures, private developments, and they, 20 years later, are a tremendous success. Here in Kansas City, that de demanded public investment. We've spent $100 million, and we've got very little to show for it. Another $27 million is not going to make a dis difference. Everybody knows that. If we're serious about pervert preserving and promoting 18th and Vine, we need private business to do it, not government. How do you get that accomplished, though? What has to happen? Well, I, you know, I don't 
don't know because yeah. the city has made such a mess over the past 20 years that I'm sure businesses would look at this and say, you know what, we'd rather go 10 blocks away to the Power and Light District than try to set up shop in 18th and Vine, another entertainment district, uh, and, and, uh, and go against the, the recent history, which you, is you, no You've traffic. written about this, have you not, on the, the Show Me Institute website? Have, yes. And so people who might want to hear more of your comments or read more of your comments can go there. What is the... Sure. People can visit us at showmeinstitute.org. We've got a blog there, and it talks about airports and streetcars and 18th and Vine. Steve, what about 18th and Vine? You've been here since it <laughs> began the second time uh, I've, since I've the been original. Here since there was dirt since, down there. <laughs> since I mean. the Cleaver plan, uh, yeah. when when uh, the man who Cleaver was he mayor then or on the council at that time? Council, it was on the, the council, plan, was and, council, and it was a great idea. I thought at the time I went to opening day down there. It was a wonderful event. And uh, are the problems that have developed there correctable? Well, it's had pathetic management over the years. It's caused a, a lot of the problems, both the jazz. Hall, uh, museum and the Negro Baseball League. Uh, I go there to the Blue Room uh, yeah. periodically, but it, I don't know about this. You know, uh, Jamika's talked about measuring results, and if you're going to measure results, there's, it's pretty bad. And so how do you measure how you're going to spend $27 million and is it going to make a difference? And I, I'm real skeptical. All right, quickly over here, Jamika, you want to see more money spent at 18th and Vine? I'd like to see more money invested in the people who live there and not necessarily in the buildings on 18th and Vine. Annie? Buck O'Neill was the driver of 18th and Vine. Everybody goes down there to go to the Negro <laughs> Leagues Baseball Museum. I raised money with him and for the museum for 10 years. And without Buck, it would be nothing. And we learned that there is private <coughs> investment available. We learned that school buses come there because they go to the museum. And we know that the um, Major League Baseball has invested money in a u urban youth yeah. baseball behind the museum. <coughs> so the action that needs to be taken now, I think, is affordable housing in that area. And what affordable housing does is bring people and people bring restaurants and stores. All right, moving on. The city council has approved $13 million in bonds and tax incentives to revitalize the Linwood Shopping Center at Linwood and Prospect. This includes the city's purchase of a grocery store. Councilman Scott Taylor offered this rationale. Sometimes a city has to step in to bring a full-service grocery store to urban core neighborhoods that have endured a food desert for nearly a decade. So, Patrick, is that really the city's job? No, it's not, and, and it's not going to meet with any success. I mean, the USDA just recently published a paper saying, oops, <coughs> never mind. Uh, apparently, food deserts aren't a function of how far people are from grocery stores. In fact, people often travel further than their local grocery store. Uh, the problem, as the report said, the report said b boldly, it is not a matter of building new grocery stores. It's a matter of changing habits uh, and, and driving, uh, driving demand for products through... Uh, uh, all sorts of intervention, not just a matter of putting new stores there. And remember, at Linwood, there was a grocery store there that went under because it didn't make enough money. Steve, and you worked at... built one on 31st in Prospect. That's exactly right. <laughs> I mean, on 39th in Prospect. Yeah. Steve, 30 seconds. You, you used to work at City Hall, Kay Barnes, yeah. chief of staff when she was mayor. Is this defensible of building a, a grocery store and paid for by the city? I, I, I happen to think it is worth it. Worth it. I mean, it, it, that area is very depressed, and if this will bring it back, uh, otherwise they're going to have to find, and finding developers are very difficult, these are truths, and then you have to incentivize them, so I think the city felt like, let's just do it ourselves. All right, now it is time for Roast and Toast, where the Ruckheads celebrate or eviscerate people and events in the news, and we begin with Annie Presley. I'm toasting my friend Shazi Branton today. We are going to bury her tomorrow at 95. And I want everybody to know how wonderful her legacy is to Kansas City. She came here in the, she was born and raised in Independence and spent her whole life in Kansas City. And in the late 40s, she and a posse of women decided they were going to make Kansas City great. And they worked on hospitals, museums, universities, and nonprofits. And all of those organizations are now winning national and international awards. So thank you, Shazi. Patrick is trying to make Kansas City great again. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, along those lines, my roast this week is to Gail Abuhalka and the Kansas City Star that uh, employs him. Uh, the Star has bemoaned in its news pages and its editorial pages the coarseness of rhetoric this political season, but they seem to overlook uh, the number one offender in their own newspaper. Uh, on this program, in print, and most recently on Twitter, uh, where Yale condemned people to hell, 
uh, he has uh, kind of uh, plunged new territory in an incivil, impolitic discourse. And it is unworthy of Kansas City and certainly unworthy of Kansas City's newspaper. He may have learned that by being on Ruckus all those years. <laughs> uh, Jamika? Um, I actually want to toast a group of people, um, teachers. I know that every successful business person, every successful politician, anybody with any success has a teacher that they can point to in their life that influenced them and believed in them and caused them to believe in themselves. And so I work with a lot of amazing teachers and I want to toast them for sticking with our families and our kids, even with a lot of political tension and without a lot of thanks. So thank you. Steve. I would like to do something novel, unroast somebody. Uh, about three months ago on this program, I roasted the national media for their pathetic coverage of Donald Trump. None of them were holding him accountable. They wouldn't let him, they wouldn't force him to answer questions. Now that is a complete turnaround. I think it was Jake Tapper and CNN, 23 times, finally got Trump to admit he's a racist when it came to the judge of Mexican descent uh, on the case uh, in the fraud at Trump University. All right, and finally, here's a roast to Republican candidates such as John Bruner, who refer to themselves in commercials as constitutional conservatives. The adjective is unnecessary, or should be. Understood correctly, conservatism itself implies a respect for tradition and reverence for the rule of law, both embodied in the U.S. Constitution. If you don't respect tradition and constitutional order, you're likely not a conservative. You might be Steve Glorioso. <laughs> And that is Ruckus for this time. We're back next Thursday at 7. Now for the Ruckettes and the crew, I'm Mike Shannon saying thanks very much for watching and good night.